Hello everyone and welcome to my Space Shuttle Special in Kerbal Space Program 0.23. This special involves the Realism Overhaul set of mods including Real Solar System, Deadly Reentry, and a whole host of other Realism mods. I'm doing post commentary in this special because this was actually a test mission I recorded for reference that turned out to be the first successful mission of the system so I wanted to, uh, well I wanted to use the footage. Anyway, you'll notice that the burn times for each stage are correct. However, the external tank is heavier than it should be and so are the SRBs. And the problem is actually with the SRBs. I'll, I'll discuss it on the way up. I don't think I have much time here if I remember how long I recorded this part. Anyway, the shuttle itself is also heavier than it should be by a little bit and that's mainly because the RCS tank right there is actually 5 tons when it's empty and that sh that sh that's wrong. Uh, that, that it should not weigh that much when it's empty. Um, otherwise, the parts for the shuttle are B9 aerospace parts, uh, resized based on the Realism Overhaul mod, and of course the wings are procedural wings, as well as the control surfaces are also procedural wings. And you'll notice that the engines are tilted to the requisite 10 degrees. That's because of the adjustment of real engines. I did not have to do part clipping to allow for that. Anyway. Time to go out to the launch pad here. Alright, so here we are on the launch pad and you can see the configuration. The SRBs are actually shorter than they should be I think, um, but they're heavier, much heavier. And the reason for that is because they burn at their full thrust continuously whereas the real SRBs would have tapered off and slowly lost thrust on the way up. So. Um, if to get the proper thrust in the beginning, I had to uh, make them heavier. And it was necessary to get the proper thrust in the beginning, as you'll see, because of the way it needs to lift off. Now, I do have it configured to light the shuttle main engines first, and then the SRBs, so we will see that. And uh, other than that, uh, you'll notice I have smart ass, a smart ASS on the side there, ready to go, uh, to make the accurate maneuvers. And I can maneuver this whole thing by hand, but uh, I was still testing, so I was actually jotting down numbers while I was doing this, so I need a smart ASS to help me out with the maneuvers. However, I will be launching this manually at the beginning. So uh, yeah, I will be controlling this on my own at the start. And is there anything else to say? Nope, I think we're ready to go. Okay, so there we go, and uh, so this is my own attempt to control it, and it is absolutely necessary to have the full gimbling. So the space shuttle main engines are tilted 10 degrees, and they also have 10 degrees worth of gimbling in that direction, and all of that is necessary to keep this stable right now. The SRBs have their uh, a little bit more than their normal takeoff thrust and uh, that was necessary, but uh, less than the maximum thrust of the real SRBs. Uh, so there's that. So here we go for the roll maneuver, and this is actually one of the reasons why I don't have smart ASS on right now. It's because it does this roll maneuver very badly. Uh, in particular, it does it too slowly. So yep, yeah, roll maneuver. <coughs> And, oh, you'll notice that the thrust setting is at one-third, but that's not really one-third of the shuttle um, shuttle engine thrust. It's actually about 75% uh, 70, because the shuttle engines can only go down to 66% or so. I forget what the exact number is, 66, 68% or something like that. So uh, the bottom end of the throttle range is actually 68% or something like that. I'd have to look it up, I forget what it is. Um, the, all the engines are uh, modified by the real engine pack, so... So those are real shuttle engines, RS-25Ds. And uh, with all their efficiency, wonderful, wonderful efficiency. The SRBs also have their uh, proper ISPs. I adjusted the tech level to make sure that the SRBs have the correct uh, ISP there. And you can see 251 right now. It goes up to 268, I believe, uh, at altitude. Uh, everything else is good. You can see, see the wonderful specific impulse on the RS-25Ds there. So here uh, I 
adjust smart ASS in increments of five degrees. I did extensive testing. There was at least a dozen tests where I failed in re-entry and then another th a dozen tests where I uh, just couldn't hit the KSC right. So this, this test will end up at the KSC. I'll tell you that right now. I hope I'm, well of course I'm ruining it for in terms of the suspense, but hey, um, let's just go with that. All right. Otherwise, it's very nominal, and I'm adjusting the pitch based on all the testing that I had done. So this is as good as it gets as far as the as far as the launch profile. Obviously, this isn't the real shuttle. It is heavier. It has different dynamics, and so the launch profile is also different. Um, yeah, especially the wings are different. You'll notice I only put a single piece wing. I could have made the wings look a lot more like the shuttle wings, but I wasn't entirely sure about the dynamics of that. I preferred the straight delta wing like this so that I could know what was going on. And uh, yeah, the the gliding of this, this shuttle the way I've got it is very much like a brick. <laughs> it's 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 probably what the shuttle is like, uh, I think. So um, at least as close as I could get it. I probably should play orbiter a bit to uh, to make sure that uh, I actually have the right shuttle feel. I think uh, orbiter might help. I'm reaching for my notebook here, where I had all my notes for for all the shuttle launches, and there were a lot. So. So I know the launch profile. I've got the whole launch profile written down, uh, adjustment by adjustment here. So for instance, 18 kilometers, we go to 55 degrees. And eventually, the, the boosters do run out exactly when the real shuttle boosters run out. It's around 44 kilometers. So I got that right. And uh, the burn time is right, like I said. It's uh, 2 minutes and 3 seconds for the solid rocket boosters. Um, so there, there are certain things that I uh, prioritized in terms of making sure I got them right, and there are other things like the mass of the total vehicle that I didn't prioritize, and uh, those are a bit off. And you know, because of the parts themselves, I really couldn't make those perfect. So uh, yeah, we're going to 300 kilometer circular orbit, by the way, and uh, that is the plan. And I've uh, literally for every test, I jotted down uh, by altitude where everything was. And especially on re-entry, that was critical to troubleshoot the whole thing. Okay. So here we're uh, getting ready to get to our pitch, our proper pitch for the SRB separation. The proper pitch is 35 degrees and I will hold it at 35 degrees um, while the SRBs are separating. This is uh, absolutely necessary as you'll, you'll see. You'll see. Uh, at this pitch everything goes fine a hundred percent of the time. And you will see that if I try to tilt it any other way uh, it would not be as good. Uh, if I try to tilt it down more, closer to 30, the SRBs will hit the orbiter. If I try to tilt it less, we won't have enough speed, horizontal speed, uh, going into the orbiter stage. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn on SA uh, RCS here, and that's to help keep stability. And this is one portion that Smart ASS really, really does it better than I do when I'm launching it manually because I can't keep it stable the way Smart ASS does. So here's the SRB separation. And yeah, you can see a really tight margin, but it works every time. At, at 35 degrees, it'll work every time. Uh, regardless of uh, any, uh, you saw it sort of had a weird roll there, and it can do that differently at different uh, uh, releases, but it always works. And pretty much immediately after that, we go to 30 degrees still need RCS to uh, help keep it stable here and I just checked to make sure nothing did get damaged by the SRB separation 
So now we have a long burn ahead of us. And um, among the things I didn't uh, talk about uh, during the VAB section was our payload. Uh, payload in the bay is just a crew tank. The Hitchhiker can has been resized by Realism Overhauls. or Yeah, I think it's just Realism Overhaul that resized it to a larger size. And has a mass of about 6 tons, I think. And with this orbiter, it's necessary to load things back to front. Okay, uh, otherwise uh, it doesn't like it. Uh, not, not on the launch portion. The launch portion is fine. It's the re-entry portion. It needs to have as much mass back in the payload bay as possible. So, the little crew tank is in the back. And that, mean, that crew tank allows us to carry a total of seven Kerbals if necessary. We're only carrying three this time, obviously. But uh, the addition of the Hitchhiker can means that we can carry seven. The total payload possible is 25 tons. To get 25 tons uh, into orbit safely, we need to fill up the liquid fuel and oxidizer for the, that's for the OMS engines. The OMS engines obviously don't look like the real shuttle OMS engines and they're mounted in line with the center of mass of the vehicle uh, so that I can use them any time and they don't need so much gimbling. So the liquid fuel and oxidizer are purely for the OMS engines. They obviously don't feed the shuttle main engines, which are drawing the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from the external tank and will not be able to be lit without that external tank. So, uh, so once the external tank is gone, no more shuttle main engines, as it should be. But uh, the OMS engines need to have full tanks of liquid fuel and oxidizer if we're carrying a full payload of 25 tons. Uh, in that case, we have about 1,300 delta V in them. Uh, here right now, we have commensurately lower, about 500 meters per second of delta V. So uh, still more than the actual shuttle had. The shuttle's uh, OMS engines had about 300 or so. The hypergolic fuel is, of course, for the space shuttle main engines, and so technically we do have enough for another relight, but we never use it. Uh, it's just no point using it. Um, the RCS is only on the orbiter. There is no RCS on the external tank, and that RCS burns hydrazine. So as you can see, we're carrying a large amount of hydrazine there, and we will not use all of it. Um, I mean, I guess in, in theory this load would be enough to uh, facilitate a docking with a station. Uh, we're carrying much more than we strictly need for a launch without a rendezvous with a station. Food, water, and oxygen, as you can see from TAC life support. Uh, there, for seven Kerbals, we have 21 days supply, which should be more than enough for any normal shuttle mission, obviously. Uh, in fact, we could carry less, but I, uh, I just went with uh, 21 days. It sounded good. And uh, mass-wise, it, it's not a huge contributor. One thing that is a contributor, and you'll see the parachutes on the side there. One thing that is a huge contributor to the mass of the orbiter is the fact that I decided to add parachutes just in case. And during testing, it was very important. Whenever I missed the KSC, I used the parachutes to make sure that the orbiter landed safely. So we do have uh, an ability to keep the orbiter safe even if we don't find a proper landing location. Uh, so keep that in mind, but those add a lot of mass because there's, I think, what is it? Uh, at least 18, I think. I'll have to, uh, I have to take a look. I forget how many I put on there. I put them on there a while back. Once I was able to get through re-entry, I started putting the parachutes on in order to make sure that uh, no matter what we could keep the Kerbal safe and so uh, so I've been parachute landing them ever since and even if some of the parachutes burn up on re-entry which they now don't after I fixed everything up and made sure that my re-entry profile is proper but uh, even if they did uh, overheat uh, we can lose up to four parachutes and still return the orbiter safely uh, it touches down at roughly uh, 11 meters per second and ideally we don't want to lose the ones up front which provide leverage to make sure the nose stays up but even if the nose ends up uh, 
uh, if, if, even if it approaches whatever it's landing on nose down, uh, the parachutes are good enough to uh, keep the whole thing safe somehow. Don't ask me how, it should probably be substantially damaged if it uh, lands nose down. Okay, so here we are. We are now going to pitch zero, which is not the lowest pitch in our launch profile. And the reason it's not the lowest pitch is because the space shuttle main engines are tilted up 10 degrees. So we actually go to negative 10 on the pitch. So you'll see that. But we've only gained less than half of the orbital velocity we need to get uh, into orbit around Earth. We need a surface velocity of 7.3 kilometers per second, 7,300 meters per second. So we're a long way off, however, this portion is much quicker than the whole launch so far. Um, as you can see, our vessel mass uh, is descending through 400 tons, and that means that the external tank is still like three times the orbiter's mass even at this stage. So, uh, and you can see the tilt on the, orbi uh, the orbiter's engines, uh, which uh, compensate for the mass of the external tank. Obviously the reason we need to go to negative pitch here is because we need to keep our apoapsis down while we uh, lift our periapsis. I put a minimum amount of separatons, so with the SRBs you saw that uh, they just barely cleared everything. They had a lot of separatrons on them. Their empty mass, the empty mass of the SRBs is 60 tons. Okay, so I, they, they, they really probably needed a lot more separatrons, much stronger separatrons, but I put the bare minimum because everything you put on is just more mass. And uh, so they clear as they do, and the uh, external tank also has a minimum of uh, separatrons so that it clears just enough so that I can uh, get past it. And it's always safe, I've never crashed into my external tank. And I say never, that's a lot of launches in this case. This has been a many months long endeavor to uh, get this right. After doing the, uh, the Saturn V and the N1L3, uh, this was really the next thing, next logical thing. Obviously, it's the, in terms of big launch vehicles, this is the next most difficult, and um, really it is the most difficult, I think. I, I can't imagine any, anything more difficult than getting this right uh, around the real Earth. Uh, obviously, it'd be much more impressive to do it stock. But I don't think uh, I, I'll, I'll lodge the challenge out there. Uh, I I don't think this is possible in stock to you do well with the real solar system stock parts with the real solar system and realism overhaul to actually uh, get a shuttle up. Uh, but but maybe somebody can prove me wrong. That would be very very impressive. I'm already impressed by everybody's shuttle in stock ASP. Those are all great, I think. I think uh, I haven't seen... Well, I'm okay, if, if the shuttles are sort of weak shuttles, then uh, they don't have wings or there's... As long as they're legit shuttles, they're all great with, uh, of course, EJ's on on Twitch TV being uh, the most impressive, which with his uh, stock hinged doors, which, yeah. I can, as much testing and as much uh, effort as I put into this, I'm sure I didn't cover even a fraction of the time that he spent on those. Okay, so uh, we are we're close to uh, cut off for orbit. Uh, it's just another thousand delta v, and this thousand delta v goes by very quickly. And so, remember, the engines are just off or on at this point. Well, this, these do throttle, but um, when I turn them off, I turn them off. They're, uh, I technically have one relight, but I'm not going to use it. And you can see the stage time in the custom info window there. And uh, so 50 seconds. We won't use all 50 seconds. Yep. 
Uh, the Kerbals are very excited throughout most of the landing process, which is the most harrowing part for me. The easy part for me is the launch, even when I'm handling it on my own without uh, smart ASS. But uh, for some reason they're very stoic in this phase. Oh well. By the way, uh, if you notice when I pressed F3 earlier, the G-forces uh, after the SRB separation don't go above 4 Gs. Now really, uh, at SRB separation, they shouldn't be peaking in terms of their G-forces. Uh, that's because the SRBs are going full thrust all the way instead of tapering off. Uh, but, but anyway, I've limited it to 4 Gs. I think actually we get a little bit above 4 Gs before external tank separation, so I think really I should be throttling down here to keep it under 4 Gs. Uh, 4 Gs is the normal maximum in this case. But uh, but I don't, so we, we're, we're creeping up on the G meter there, if you can see. Okay, we're coming up on uh, main engine cutoff. There we go. And so you'll see the external tank does re-enter. And we c probably could have pushed it a little bit more than that, uh, but this is fine. Just checking everything, and uh, we get our attitude to zero degrees pitch with RCS on before separation. And I think we're clear for separation here. Yep. And then I change to negative 10 pitch. And then light the OMS engines. And so there's OMS burn 1 as we get clear of the external tank. And we set our apoapsis to 300 kilometers as advertised. Okay, well, a, a few meters below 300 kilometers. Close enough. And then uh, go back to zero pitch if we could. Yes. Making sure to turn RCS on. We do have huge reaction wheels in this thing. Uh, those help, uh, and those are from B9 Aerospace as well, helping to keep this stable. Uh, and the reaction wheels are only in the orbiter. There are no reaction wheels on the external tank. All, all the sensitive electronics are in the orbiter. Everything except for fuel, basically, are in the orbiter. Um, so here we go. And Smart ASS can't hold the attitude through the time warping, unfortunately. So we do have this weird pitch issue, and it'll have to correct that once we stop time warping. So here we go for for our second OMS burn. And this of course to get us into our circular orbit. I have to make sure to uh, keep the throttle down in this case because uh, we want to be as close to our apoapsis when we do this as possible. And in fact I think I do pitch down a bit in order to limit my, oops, drag the custom info window there, in order to limit the apoapsis. So uh, I see the apoapsis is creeping up there, and so at some point, uh, yeah, change the pitch to pitch down. Smart ASS is much more essential on the re-entry portion because the re-entry is so long. If you thought the launch was long, don't worry, I cut out most of the re-entry portion. Uh, it takes more than an hour to re-enter with this thing, uh, but, I, but I chopped that up. But uh, yeah, uh, for those burns, I would rather be doing something else like reading a book. Uh, so I have Smart ASS keep the, keep the attitude during that. Uh, time warping during re-entry is not a good idea, I have found. Okay, so uh, here we are slowly creeping up to uh, 300 by 300. And you can see the vehicle mass is still pretty high. We'll actually re-enter at about 92 tons. We're at 97 tons right now, and uh, that's heavier than the orbiter uh, would be with, uh, with only 6 tons worth of cargo. Again, it's the RCS tank that for some reason has a 5 ton empty mass. That's, that's a killer. The parachutes are a killer. The, the mass of the parachutes, I now understand why they didn't put parachutes. Well, actually, you know what, 
uh, I'm putting parachutes across the entire orbiter, saving the entire vehicle intact. They didn't really have to do well. I guess they would have to do that, wouldn't they? It'd be tough to figure out how to decouple the crew section or somehow separate the crew section with explosive bolts uh, or something like that in order to uh, pop parachutes just on the crew portion. Not too sure that will work out. So I guess maybe they would have had to. Uh, they would have had to. No, I can't imagine that they would. I'm sure they would have figured something out. But the mass would still have been pretty, pretty prohibitive. Okay, so here we are. There it is. Close enough for, uh, for my own purposes. So first, fix the pitch. Next, the space shuttle actually goes uh, in orbit backwards. And the reason for that is because the, in this case, the engines will be shielded, uh, shielding the crew from debris. So it's not a problem if the debris in space hits the engine side, because after all, they don't actually need the, the main engines anymore, and uh, that's what would get damaged probably. Um, it's just in general a safer side to point the thing. Now I'm rolling it like this mainly for aesthetic purposes <laughs> it's uh, it's just uh, aesthetic as far as I'm concerned I'm opening the cargo bay doors which which they would do because that is to prevent overheating of the bay and uh, so the heat radiation is done by opening the cargo bay and they have thermal properties uh, anyway you get the idea I do have lights in the cargo bay, but not on the orbiter itself because they would provide extra drag and, especially on re-entry, extra heat. So there are lights in the cargo bay, but not outside on the orbiter. Okay, so uh, we transition here. And here, I'm adjusting my orbit for re-entry. And this is because during testing, the previous test I did, I was able to get it within one degree longitude of the KSC at a 252 kilometer apoapsis. So starting from a 252 kilometer apoapsis, I was able to get it within one degree of the KSC and I have all the data from that approach, which was my closest ever approach. And so I'm using that data to make the approach this time. But in order to do that, I need to get my orbit to 252. And I'm just going to do a circular orbit at 252 here. So I'm doing burns at both sides, as you can see. I'm not too, I, I doubt they ever run the OMS, well, yeah, I doubt they run the OMS engines while the cargo bay is open and definitely not maneuver, but this is smart ASS that's maneuvering it right now. This is not my fault. It really wouldn't be maneuvering. Anyway, this is the deorbit burn now. So the deorbit burn will take it to 252 by 80 kilometers. And that was why I tested it at. And so I'm starting the burn one degree before I started the burn in the test in the hope that I will get back down one degree ahead and therefore hit the KSC. So these are the things I have to do. Basically, uh, everything depends on how you enter the atmosphere. And uh, here we go. So entering at the right point is critical. After that, everything just happens. There's no way you can change the re-entry profile too much because uh, there is some adjustment. I can probably uh, adjust it uh, within three degrees worth of longitude. I could probably figure out how to fix its trajectory, but not too much more than that with this orbiter. Obviously, the space shuttle is much better at this. But this orbiter is not quite as good, and mainly it's deadly re-entry. If, uh, if I try and uh, make its uh, a pitch less steep, it will heat up too much and explode. That's basically the idea. So I'm constrained, and being constrained, I have to hit the re-entry properly. No, no substantial cross-range ability with this thing. So, we are using the Space Shuttle's 40 degree up angle on re-entry. This is what the Space Shuttle does, and you know what? It's exactly what we need. Uh, there's, there's no other choice. It, it, it really, we have to hit it this way, 
Um, I, I bring it down to 30 degrees at one point. I'll show you that. But uh, in general, we're going to be 40 degrees all the way until we hit around 55 kilometers and then uh, forces take over and we won't be able to maintain 40 degrees up up angle and and that's just how it should be okay now this is the portion where I have to adjust to 30 degree pitch and that's because no matter what I do at this point it will threaten to go up so at 92.5 kilometers I know I have to adjust to 30 degrees pitch otherwise we start going up doing this we will not go up we will uh, continue our downward descent albeit very 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 slowly uh, at some points it is pretty much zero but during all that time our speed is bleeding off so it's a very useful zero you'll notice I have speed brakes on this those are necessary too they also provide downforce which means that uh, I can't keep them on once we uh, pass 70 kilometers. The downforce will actually uh, prevent me from keeping the nose up, so I have to uh, put, down the spo uh, put down the spoilers uh, once we pass 70 kilometers. Anyway, uh, here we are, and around here I should be looking to get back to 40 degrees pitch. Yep. So we are now at 40 degrees pitch. How do I know that's time to do 40 degrees pitch? 7,250 meters per second. That's, that's my point for readjusting the pitch to 40 degrees. So it's all about speed there. Now I took notes on the condition of the craft every 2,000 uh, 2, meters. And especially at the, every 10 kilometers was a key point so this is passing the 90 kilometer mark and I made note of the longitude to see how we were doing and in this case we are we are doing fine okay and then uh, we're coming up on our next check after a little bit of a transition here after 88 kilometers I decide we no longer need the spoilers the air brakes so but I'll pop them up uh, every now and again along the way as I see my longitude is, is uh, not not where I want it to be. So here again I raise the spoilers and you've seen you see I've got the heavy duty landing gear up. That's the part that I use to gauge the temperature of the craft throughout all my tests and that's because it's sticking out a bit so it does get hot. If we pass 950 degrees Celsius the parachutes start to be jeopardized by the time we get to 1050 degrees Celsius with that landing gear uh, the craft is basically going to be destroyed uh, so and that's just uh, that part and from experience so just telling you ahead of time uh, that's a number we do not want to cross okay getting below 70 kilometers this is critical at this point I need to have the longitude pretty much perfect because I have very little ability to change it and you can see I've still got the air brakes on but now I've uh, lowered them and if you noticed before I lowered them uh, the pitch uh, reading on the in the bottom left hand corner was all the way up so I was having trouble maintaining the 40 degree up pitch angle with the air brakes up here you go again I've got air brakes up and you can see the maximum pitch angle in the corner there and it's pushing the nose down because it can't maintain the 40 degrees but that's fine because I wanted it to uh, basically whenever I have the speed brakes out I want it to descend faster that's that's the goal and so pushing the nose down in that case is fine except when we get to this point 60 kilometers here pushing the nose down is not a good idea because it means we'll heat up more you can see our temperature creeping up there on the heavy duty landing gear and at a certain point if I push the nose down I might actually lose control so all very very careful here everything very extensively tested uh, the next key point is 58 kilometers at that point we turn RCS on in order to maintain our up angle. So uh, here we go. 
58 kilometers and RCS on. I also uh, prepare to adjust the pitch. Our next pitch setting will be 35 degrees at 55 kilometers. And you can see the temperature is well in check here. So, uh, so I'm not too worried about that. We are on a good, good descent profile to keep the Kerbal safe. Anything else of note at this point? Nope, I mean, uh, we're, we're pretty much spot on here. I'm trying to look for the KSC at this point, trying to figure out where it is. Okay. I decided, I think, to do the pitch down early. And uh, that is because I was thinking that we were a little bit too far. We were going to overshoot just a bit. So doing it a little bit early helps with that. That's basically my only choice at this point. Okay, 50 kilometers. We go to 30 degrees angle. 800 plus degrees on the landing gear. This is the most difficult part when it comes to the re-entry heat. Passing through 50 kilometers. Okay. So right now, giving it a final check here, and taking a look at our trajectory, and you can see our approach to KSC. The problem is I'm not able to see it on the ground right now, so I'm a little bit worried about whether it may be too dark. 45 kilometers, and we are going to descend to 25 degrees. At this point, uh, Smart ASS is not going to be able to hold it for very long. I'm going to take manual control at 40, well, uh, a little bit below 40 kilometers. Uh, temperature is no longer a problem here. Uh, as you can see, it's descending steadily. Four, uh, 50 kilometers is really the key point. After that, uh, everything is smooth in terms of the temperature. We will need to use the OMS engines in order to help us with the landing. And that's because I haven't got the trajectory perfect yet. So just a warning about that ahead of time. Forty two kilometers. We go to twenty degrees angle. Okay, now I see the KSC, so I'm trying to gauge when to do these pitch adjustments, and this is the last one the Smart ASS is going to be able to handle. Uh, even with the RCS, uh, it just can't deal with anything more. Okay, 36 degrees, uh, 36 kilometers, sorry. And here I should be getting ready to turn off Smart ASS and take manual control. You can see Smart ASS can no longer keep the 20, pit, 20 degree pitch. And I am now going to pitch it down 20 degrees. Uh, actually, uh, anywhere from negative 10 to negative 30, depending on where I think I need to be for the landing. So uh, no more cuts in this video. I'm going to show the landing through. Uh, obviously, as I told you, I did extensive testing, lots and lots and lots of attempts beforehand. But what you've seen here is a straight cut. No, uh, no quick saving during this this particular mission. Uh, if I had to restart, I would restart from start. So uh, this was a single mission. And boy was I excited once I got to this point. This, just the fact that I was behind the KSC instead of totally off. Just the fact that I had the runway in sight was an amazing thing. And I was all ready to go for landing here. There's no way I was going to let this opportunity pass. There's no guarantee. Remember, all I was doing is trying to adjust that one degree that I was off on the longitude. And so there was no guarantee that I would actually hit the KSC this time. That's why I wasn't doing the commentary at the same time. And I'm recording it after the fact. So, uh, yep. But I wanted to record the mission because I wanted to uh, make sure that I had a record of it. Just in case I happened to get it right. So, so here we go. 
I'm just running the engines a little bit. Uh, it's not really necessary at this point. Um, it's for a little bit of maneuvering sake and making sure I can lift the nose. G-forces are a bit high. Um, really we shouldn't be pulling G's at all at this point and it's because I'm I'm struggling a little bit to keep attitude. You can see we have about 460 meters per second. These, these uh, OMS engines have nowhere near the thrust to weight ratio to uh, help this orbiter out if we were in any substantial trouble. It's nowhere near one. That's, I think they're 150 kilonewtons apiece uh, and it's only two of them even though they have two nozzles. So it's uh, 300 kilonewtons and the orbiter is 90 tons give or take. So uh, the thrust weight ratio of a third is what we're talking about here. Okay, you can see me try to line up and for some reason I'm not tilting my wings. I really should bank a little bit here. Come on. Stop using yaw. Start using roll. There we go. Alright, at some point I need to get my landing gear down, obviously. And, uh, oh no, I have it down. Missed that. Did I miss that? Uh, doing post commentary is a little bit tough. I hope it's entertaining though. At least I get to talk freely without uh, having to worry about controlling the craft. And so here you go. This is what it sounds like when I, I'm not controlling the truck craft and talking at the same time. Okay. Here we go. Trying to line up properly. And, uh, and I've uh, checked this out. That, uh, it is good good to 70 meters per second so it, it can still uh, function properly without stalling down to 70 meters per second so that's good. It's not really great on lift as you can tell. Um, yeah it's it's seriously hard I'm I have to say and I know from experience from the testing of course that uh, I have to keep the nose down as far down as I feel safe as long as possible. You can see we're still losing speed here. So it's not like I can uh, hold it nose up or any angle less than negative 20 degrees without uh, jeopardizing the landing. Okay, but otherwise everything is good. We're still quite heavy. Uh, this, this orbiter can get lighter. Obviously we can dump the crew tank that's six tons. Oh, the flap under the engine. Uh, in most of my configurations early on, I didn't have that at all. I decided to add that. It sort of helps. I know it, I, it probably doesn't uh, get used as a control surface like I'm doing here. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't, but, uh, but I like it. <laughs> I, uh, it seemed helpful. Okay, here we go. And full throttle. I think I can glide this down if I really get it in properly. If I get the approach just right, I can glide it down, I think. But that'll take a lot of practice. I've also done a U-turn with it, so it can do U-turn. So that's, that's a doable thing. And... Touchdown! Whoa! Whoa! Okay, unfortunately the wheels are very close together. Uh, because uh, putting the wheels on procedural wings doesn't work very well. So here I am using rudder trying to make sure I keep it on the runway. Oop. And slowing down here. Yeah, putting the B9 aerospace landing gear on the procedural wings tends to be a recipe for disaster. So I keep the B9 aerospace landing gear on the B9 aerospace parts and that seems to work better. Okay, here we go. Get the parking brakes on. And let's take a look at our craft. All our all the parts are good. 
a little bit of a hard landing, but what you expect with a orbiter like this. So, there you have it, my space shuttle, uh, called the Shuttle Feynman for now. I'm sure I'll come up with other names as well as we do different missions, but uh, that's that's for the future. I'm just glad to have gotten one mission in and gotten my Kerbals back to the KSC runway successfully. All right. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments, suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.